we're looking at the last section in John chapter 8, which finishes off a big section that we saw from the beginning of chapter 7 all the way here to the end of chapter 8, where Jesus is teaching in the temple during the Festival of Tabernacles. The sermon I preached on this section I called The Truth Will Set You Free. Remember, John's big aim in writing is stated in the end of the book, John 20, verse 30 and 31, where John tells us that throughout this book, he's giving us evidence about Jesus. Evidence which calls for belief in Jesus. And for those who believe in Jesus, they find life through Jesus. And so evidence, belief, life are what we're looking for throughout this book. And in this section, Jesus is giving us evidence about himself. And he wants us to see that those who have truly been uh, set free by him will be set free from a sin, they'll be set free from the devil, and they'll be set free from death. And that freedom comes by holding on or by hearing Jesus' word, believing that word, finding life through that word, and then holding tightly to that word and obeying that word for the rest of your life. That's what true freedom looks like. Now, if you haven't yet taken the time to read through this passage yourself, then do that now, pause the video, read it a few times, look for repeated ideas, uh, key things that jump out of the text as you read it, and spend some time praying and ask God to open your eyes to see this evidence about Jesus and to truly believe it so that you can rejoice in this life that is found in Jesus. Now there are a couple of wonderful promises that are made in this section. Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples and then you will know the truth and the promise, the truth will set you free. And then Jesus says here in verse 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And then another promise, very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Glorious promises. Promises of true freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from the devil, freedom from death. Now a helpful tool in a section like this is to separate out the different characters and so this section starts by telling us of the Jews who had believed, which links back to uh, verse 30. We were told that even some of them believed. That belief is going to be uh, questioned in this section. So although John has written this so that we will believe and find life, uh, the true belief is a belief that really holds on uh, to Jesus' word and obeys that word for the rest of your life. And so these Jews who believe, their belief is going to be put into question. So let's just look at where they are mentioned through this section. Now just if you top and tail this section, you see that the Jews who had believed, by the end they pick up stones to try and kill Jesus. So clearly their belief is not saving faith. It's a belief, they've, they've come to believe certain things about Jesus, but they haven't come yet to believe that he is indeed the son of God who can set them free from death and give them life eternal. So the next uh, character to highlight is our Lord Jesus himself. A number of things he says about his teaching in this section. And just this statement right at the end of this section about Jesus, the I am statement. Uh, again, that's, we saw it, we've seen it a few times in John so far, uh, but this is the most explicit uh, link back to Exodus 3.14, where God said to Moses that, he, he, that Moses must call him I am. And so Jesus here is clearly claiming to be God. And so their belief in Jesus wasn't yet a belief that he truly was God. And that's why they then picked up stones to kill him. Another character, not in the story itself, but a character from the Old Testament referenced throughout the story is Abraham. In 
And God the Father is also mentioned as a character throughout this. So those are our key characters in the story, uh, but then we also uh, hear Jesus speaking about the truth a few times, the truth that will set them free. Uh, he also says here, yeah, if you are truly, is truly my disciples, and he used this language, very truly, I tell you. So Jesus wants them to know that what he speaks is the truth, and what the devil speaks is not the truth because there's no truth in him and with that said another character here is who jesus calls your father the devil your own father he says that a murderer from the beginning his native uh, language is lies he is the father of lies there's a number of these references to lying, not telling the truth, obviously the opposite of truth, and that the devil is that one who is a liar, opposed to the truth. Now the massive shock in what Jesus is teaching them here is that although they have believed in him, Jesus is testing the validity of that truth. And they then claim here that Abraham is our father, and that was a very important thing uh, for Jews to hold tightly to. They could trace their ancestry back uh, to Abraham and the promises given to Abraham, which you can go and read about in uh, Genesis 12 or Genesis uh, 15. But Jesus says, actually, no, Abraham isn't your father. And they then claim, well, God is our father. And Jesus says, no, Abraham's not your father. God's not your father. Actually, your father is the devil, uh, who we can go and read about this father of lies um, in Genesis chapter 3. It's where we meet him. When sin entered the world, he, he lied to Adam and Eve about God's intentions, and he caused mankind to doubt God's good plans for the world. And that's when everything went wrong. And that's because the son had to come to set us free from the sin that had entered into the world uh, because of the devil's work in the world and because of that sin jesus says we are slaves uh, they they say yeah oh, we have never been slaves to anyone um, but jesus says actually you are slaves to sin they are slaves who needed to be set free so throughout this big section in John 7 and 8, we've seen Jesus make incredible claims about himself, uh, saying that he, whoever's thirsty can come to him and drink, and we see the people turning away and not coming to him. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, and we see the people continue to walk in darkness. They don't come and follow him, believe in him. And now in this section, Jesus actually puts the spotlight on the problem, saying the problem is they are slaves to sin. And at this stage, they're absolutely unwilling to come to the Son for the Son to set them free. Uh, they are children of the devil rather than children of God. But Jesus is the one who can free them from being children of the devil, free them from being slaves of sin, which shows that they're children of the devil. And Jesus says, if you believe in me, I can free you from being a child of the devil to actually make you children of God. And the ultimate choice is seen here. If, if people remain slaves of sin, which shows that they're children of the devil, that is a road that leads to death. But Jesus is saying that he can free them from that slavery, make them children of God, which means that they won't face death. That means ultimate death, the second death. Very truly I tell you that whoever obeys my words, that is believing and continuing to believe in Jesus, will never see death. And Jesus had told them this already, uh, that those who believe in the Son have passed over from death to life. 
And yet in this section, we just see that they continue not to believe in him. And Jesus' big claim here to be the great I am, because it's only God who can free you from slavery to sin, free you from the devil and free you from death. So Jesus needs to be God in order to do that, but they won't believe in him and they pick up stones and try to kill him. And so, although in this section, Jesus is holding out glorious promises to his people, his people choose to ignore it. But the call to us is to believe the evidence that Jesus is who he says he is. And within these promises, we are told what we should do. As those who have been saved by Jesus, set free by him, what does this life of true freedom look like? If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. So he's, Jesus wants us to hold to his word. Uh, in a more literal translation, if you abide in my teaching. Uh, and this is something, this idea of um, abiding in Jesus is an idea that's going to get fleshed out in John 15 verse 1. Uh, to 16, uh, particularly verse 7, it says, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The importance of abiding in Jesus' word means that we can ask for our sins to be forgiven. Uh, we can ask, uh, we can rejoice in the fact that death is not our ultimate destiny. Uh, because those who abide in Jesus' word, those who believe in him, who have seen the evidence about him, receive life in his name. And one day we will enjoy that eternal life with him forever. And so this section is calling all of us to abide in his word. And abiding in his word means obeying his word, living in obedience to him. Now, it isn't the obedience to his word that saves us. No, once we've been set free by the Son, once He has broken our slavery to sin, uh, taken us from being children of the devil and made us children of God, once we've been moved from death to life, then we respond by holding on to His Word, abiding in His Word, by obeying His Word and living in obedience to His Word for the rest of our lives until our faith becomes sight and we see Jesus, the one who has saved us and are, are with him forever. So the challenge here is don't respond like the Jews who actually didn't believe, who end up wanting to kill Jesus. Rather, hold on to his teaching, obey his word, rejoice in the salvation he's won for you, and live for him. So God bless as you continue digging into this passage, and as you teach it to others, may they rejoice in Jesus, the one, who came to set us free from sin and the devil and death. May we then hold on to his word and obey his word as we seek to live for him. Mm -hmm.